love your suit. I am Oliver Perrin, and welcome to A Safer Space, where I am joined by Mr. Tim Rudisill. And the topic of our discussion today will be the uh, odd nature of uh, Chinese writing, the characters they use that can be called uh, pictograms or ideograms, probably uh, more safely pictograms. Um, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, first, I do want to apologize. It's been a while since I have posted. Um, I've had a whole lot going on. Uh, I beg your indulgence. Uh, things are now getting sorted in my life, and so I should be able to be turning out content more regularly. Uh, again, though, thank you for your patience. Please follow this uh, channel, A Safer Space, on YouTube. There's also a BitChute analog. Uh, please follow Semiagog, which is also on YouTube. These are two channels so that I have alternates if the uh, hammer comes down upon the channel. Uh, there's an analog for Semiagog as well over at BitChute. There is uh, Mines. There's um, Twitter, there's a Discord server, and there is Patreon for those who uh, wish to support the channel. Thanks to those who do. Uh, Gab is going through some trouble at present, uh, but I have an account there, and when they're back up and running, as I expect they will be, you can uh, follow content there as well. So with all of that out of the way, we have this oddness going on with the Chinese characters and the way in which they have for those who don't know, uh, one of their pictograms is it's, it doesn't work the way that um, phonetic uh, systems work, like our uh, alphabet doesn't even work in the way in uh, which Arabic or uh, Hebrew work, where you have the consonants indicated, and then you have, if you're doing the full version, you have secondary characters that indicate uh, vowels as well. Uh, of course, with the um, Greeks uh, and the Latin systems, the Greek and uh, Latin uh, Roman alphabet, you know, you have uh, consonants and vowels that are indicated. Uh, with Hangul in Korea, you have uh, a syllabary, which means that it uh, works based on syllables. So, you know, like ba, bi, bo, be, you know, where you have the combination of a consonant and a vowel. Well, it's not, that's not how it works with Chinese. The writing, uh, the characters are multivalent. So a single character will indicate uh, multiple things and it will do it in a more broad sense. Uh, one of the ways I first got exposed to this was when uh, Mr. Rudisil here very kindly gave me a copy of uh, the Tao, translated by one uh, Mr. McIntosh, published by the uh, Theos Theosophical Society, as I as I remember, and one of the things that is correct. One of the things pointed out in the introduction is he points out, you know, that brevity is essential to the Tao. That it's it's no great sprawling work. Uh, however, he points out that many of the translations run into the hundreds, if not the thousands, of pages, whereas the original is so seemingly simple, and yet it's multivalent, which is what produces, I guess, the challenges that anyone who wants to translate it will face. And in the case of... Kind of like translating Sun Tzu, huh? Rather. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay, fine, fine. Thank you. And we do like the Griffith translation best, don't we? Yes, yes we do. But both okay. of us, I know, have multiple translations of the Tao, multiple translations of uh, the, the Art of War and some of the other texts, uh, mm -hmm. simply because you need to read several of them. And even if you're dealing with translation from Renaissance Italian, you know, I read three or four translations simultaneously of uh, Dante's uh, comedy, simply because you have to, to get a feel for it, <clears throat> because of the limitations involved with this act we call translations, which is always more accurately a transposition. Um, however, uh, every translator is a traitor. Indeed, to uh, whoever it was that wrote the original, and whoever, mm -hmm. whomever it was that spoke the uh, the original language. So, uh, but in the case coming back quickly before I turn it over to you to the uh, Macintosh translation of the Tao, in his case, he aimed for brevity, and yet, as you yourself pointed out to me years ago, even in his case, there's a great degree of repetition, and as tiny as the little book is, it's you know, triple what it probably should be if it 
underwent a further distillation, not to belittle his translation. It's the best I know of, but uh, it kind of goes back to that. Also un, un, uh, unavailable now in print, by the way. Unless you buy it, yeah, used online. You can still yeah, get it. Sure. Bookfinder, for those of you who are watching, is a great site. If you can't find it on Amazon, go to bookfinder.com, which aggregates all the private booksellers who just upload their stuff. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't have... Uh, a good example in mind of one of these multivalent characters, perhaps, you know, Tao, which is itself uh, translated as the way, you know, is is one example because that's only one way it can be translated. You know, ah, but uh, so the way can be translated in many ways, almost okay. as the way, the truth, and the light are one. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so this brings us around to the issue of how the Ch the Chinese write and. Uh, I am I am hesitant to say that we are entirely constrained in our thought processes by the nature of the speech that we use and the nature of our writing system. So it's very popular to claim this. Um, actually, one of the fundamental aspects of postmodernism, you know, with its deep roots in linguistics as a discipline, um, you know, which of course gave birth to our things like politically correct terminology. One of the fundamental ideas there is that we are truly constrained in our thought by our speech systems. And there are many arguments that can be made in support of that. So for example, if you look at early Greek logic, right, the idea of a syllogism, you have the idea of language becoming formulaic and uh, be, being a thing that can almost be rendered mathematically. And um, in the same way that, as you told me years ago, math uh, maths amounts to a language in which um, you can lie, but if you do, it can be detected and you can be caught at it, right? It's susceptible to proof. So there are ways of saying that language and writing systems more particularly do constrain our thought. Indeed, in the Tao, there's that line, you know, though tight the net of words may bind how surely truth slips out. Um, however, I'm aware of many ways people communicate that go beyond their writing systems. We just happen to be trapped in it because of the literate nature of our education, but rhythm is a big one. Dance is a big one. They're forms of communication, forms of expression, forms even of remembering things. If one takes a particular yogic asana, that posture, that physical shape carries with it communi uh, communicative elements, uh, elements of meaning that can be remembered, that can be uh, referred to, that can be shared. So I, I, I simply wanted to put that there. I want to see you conduct a syllogism in dance. Or in rhythm, construct a syllogism in rhythm, or in dance. I believe it could be done with rhythm. Could be, could could mm, could be done. Yes. Yes, it could be. Yes. Could be. You'd have to have, uh, for example, be a hell of a way to carry on a conversation, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, mainly because dance and these other forms communicate so much more, so much more immediately, and in much uh, a uh -huh. much more multivalent way. Which I guess, to wrap my long-winded introduction up, brings us around to the issue of these Chinese characters. Mm. I just wanted to set the groundwork there because if you think of a term a as always related to these other terms, um in the sense of one character that can be read in so many ways. You know, if you have a, a think of the, a, a character of an upraised fist, you know, what could it mean? It can mean so many things. Well, you get that even with a schematized uh, Chinese character. So I believe there's something to this that it does shape uh, the great canals or the ca canalization mm. of their thought collectively. It does have that effect uh. and yet Though tight the net of words may bind, how surely truth slips out. You can also communicate in these other ways. So it can be accepted as a general rule, but there are many, many exceptions, and they exist on the fringes where things are most interesting. So with that out of the way, on the fringes, hmm. what can we learn about the Chinese from their character system? Well, what can we not learn about the Chinese from their character system? Considering that we are basically concerned with the large number of Chinese there are and how they think and how their thoughts are shaped by their language and how their thoughts are shaped by their leaders using their language. Now, when I say shaped, I, I don't mean that you can think about this, but you can't think about that. I'm talking about shading nuance value, 
to give you a couple of cheap examples, the Chinese still have a character for trouble. Trouble. It doesn't mean domestic trouble. It just means trouble. It's two women under one roof. That's the Chinese character for trouble. Now that takes us back to the most basic of peasant understandings of the concept of trouble. There is another for prosperity. It's a pig under a roof. If you got a pig under your roof, you're prosperous. And I recall there's one about writing because I did some looking into this. You know, I like to look into. You, you can learn as you, you're illustrating now. You can learn the the hidden history of a given concept within a culture by looking at these roots. That's why we look to etymology. So this is the version of etymology. I had pursued that for writing, and one of the characters that I was. But this is not etymology, Oliver. The basic image is still there. Do excuse me. Go ahead now. Much more explicitly than it is in the case of looking at the etymological chains for the West. Yet there are still parallels. But the, the, just to get that part out, I went and looked at writing. And apparently one of the characters for writing in ancient Chinese um, represents, it is said, the marking of either a threshold or a lintel with uh, cock's blood. You know, so that and apparently it had to do with some ritual and you had the idea that the house had been marked. It may, in fact, have some, you know, overlap conceptually with like the idea of Passover um, or at least the marking of the house before the gods or the public ritual. So, yeah, you can find it and it tells you the origins. And to your point, it tells you more about how they conceive of a given concept. Indeed, the very nut of the matter, how they conceive how they think about it subconsciously Oliver every time a, a Chinese person sees the image for trouble he doesn't go ooh two women under one roof you know very bad he doesn't do that and yet it is a governing conceptual archetype and if unconscious ah. no less powerful for all that perhaps even more powerful for that which means that the way the Chinese conceives of peace war prosperity, trouble, all of these things go back a long, long way and go back visually, not just by words, but by images. Right. So you have the situation where just about everybody in China can read the same writing, but if they read it out to you, it might be mutually unintelligible. Indeed, it might be. And in terms of how far back it goes, I did a little looking into that as well, given that um, Chinese is the longest continually used writing system that's still, you know, uh, out there in the world. <clears throat> um, there are two theoretical uh, originators of it. One is Kangji, and he is shown as, you know, uh, having four eyes, which is a rather interesting a uh, bit of iconography that probably bears unpacking, but not here. Uh, the other one is an even earlier one, who is the primordial sage Fu Shi, who apparently read the, um, the 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 marks left behind by animals and the signs uh, that they left, and he used it as the basis not for the writing system, but what, according to Chinese lore, uh, predates that, which is the hexagrams and trigrams all going back to either a broken or an unbroken line, a yin line or a yang line, uh, as expressed in the I Ching. Oh, Book of Changes. Oh, Book of Changes, huh? Oh, okay. Some reason that brings to mind Mr. Leg. Never mind. The, the thing is that no matter how you view this material, the images that are reached by Chinese ideographs go much further back in an unbroken stream than any system we have. <clears throat> so at a point with our words, the words are like fine scalpels. All the images that are in the Chinese word are on the periphery of our incision 
in effect, we, we go in and we open up the psyche. And we talk of words. We speak of words. We speak of symbols. We speak of images. We speak of symbol sets. The Chinese does not need to do that. He simply unpacks the word he uses daily, like trouble. What is more primitive a form of trouble than having two women under one roof? Understand, two women fight about all kinds of things under one roof because each of them wants the house to be hers with all the things that go with it. And the man who understands this understands the nature of trouble, that it percolates, it multiplies. Right, and it fits neatly when placed like one jigsaw puzzle piece next to another with the concept to be ruler of all under heaven, which is the idea of the absolute necessity for unity. And so trouble fits rather perfectly with this idea of harmony and good order. But consider prosperity, good fortune, a pig under your roof. A pig means you eat and eat well. You are rich and fat and happening. Once again, though, to your earlier point, uh, entirely, mm -hmm. if you will, and given that it doesn't quite fit here, but semantically, um, it comes straight out of the peasant's lexicon. All people are peasants in the, in the final analysis, Ollie. In terms of these fundamental needs? Yes. Aristocracy only comes into being when you have one dude in charge of a lot of peasants. Now, how he gets to be in charge of all the peasants, we can go into it another time. But he is basically a peasant on steroids. That's all. It's all an aristocrat is. Peasant on steroids. A nudden. I am a man. Nothing of a human condition is foreign to me. I, I have heard this said. Some Something about Terence comes to mind. <clears throat> but be that as it may. So what can, we, what can we learn from this with the time that remains to us? What can we learn about dealing with them and what this means and the differences? That we must, that we must take a lesson from them and learn their their way <laughs> yes their way their their uh, how their symbols are constructed because we are dealing with massive groups of Chinese people in the Confucian society in the way in which all of these things are put together in their banks, in their lending institutions, which point, are unnecessary. In, in their political parties, in their propaganda uh, programs, and uh, their it, agitations it, abroad. And as you said, this is the key to their very thought. And once long ago, an old soldier told me that you had to uh, carefully examine how a building was laid out in order to know precisely where to place the charges. Yes, I've heard that said. I've heard that said. I've also heard it said that you have to to know what you're dealing with to know when you see an anomaly. You must understand that nobody nobody violates what they learn as a child. And what they learn as a child is this basically iconography and it can become so habitual that it can never be turned loose of which brings to mind the things about you know spies checking to see if someone was like a german plant in the u.s during world war ii they'd simply ask them to do long division because they would have learned it like you did in german schools and not have thought to ever learn it the way it was taught for example in an american school and this you know if you imagine the confusion that you see with uh chinese translations into english or the confusion that can result if you try to watch one of these Chinese blockbuster movies that has subtitles and you find that you've been watching this thing and you just can't figure out what the fucking story is because 
what they translate in a particular way into English just doesn't seem to fit. It's alien to us. And we're like, why are these people fighting each other? And why is this guy considered the hero who's being cared for? Like, it's culturally so alien in some respects that it almost can't be translated. That's my point. When you go into the, the language, the ideograph, and you take the ideograph and you translate it into mythological terms, you gain a lot if you have the mechanisms to be able to understand it. All right. And the best way that I gained any exposure to that was by engaging in the closest parallel with English, which is to become fascinated with the etymological chains. But they develop, as you said, much more like a crystal forming an outcropping that sharpens and points and merges towards a thing. Whereas with the Chinese aspect, it's more like water that flows and spills over banks and things, you know, or mm -hmm. forms puddles or soaks or seeps or transforms its state into a gaseous cloud. It's much harder to snatch at this crystalline piece that you can identify as the kernel. Indeed, in Mandarin, there are many words that contain within them their opposite. So that poetic allusion is one of the main things that Mandarin, especially in speech, that Mandarin brings with it. Yeah, I'd be interested to see whether or not, because I don't know it, perhaps uh, Ms. 575 can help, but uh, in the case of haiku, do you happen to know whether oh. it's written with kanji? Because if haiku is written with the older Chinese characters, as I would expect it would, that in and of itself indicates why it's such a challenge to attempt to compress so much in an oh. English translation into the same form. But you see, it is not that difficult if one uses the oriental language because these words contain many many meanings that our words do not which is why we have so many words and they so many symbols but our words are much more precise than their symbols which means the mind interpreting the symbol must have a certain facility to be able to grasp the entirety of the idea at once. Whereas that would be a more native approach for those who use the system. Uh, well, then in closing, perhaps I can ask you, in what ways would you think that that makes them stronger? And in what ways would you imagine it makes them weaker when paired against us as, let us say, competitors in the world? I would say that they are weaker if we hold to our way and they are stronger if we become confused about our way <laughs> interesting idea because it goes back to the basics of understanding an image a symbol an ideograph an icon painters poets and philosophers are one painters, poets, and philosophers. I'm reminded of the old story about making the perfect thing and the Chinese simply polished and polished and polished a wall. Out of a so it reflected. Yes. Rumi. Rumi's a good man. He's not Chinese, though. No, he's not. 